Hello and welcome back to our campaign 2024 coverage here at The Washington Times. I'm George Gerbo. The campaign is over, the election is over, and Donald Trump has won a decisive victory and will return to the White House as only the second person ever to serve two non-consecutive terms as President of the United States. And joining me to break that down, the new transition period, what to expect in the early stages of a second Trump administration, I have once again my trusted colleagues, our national politics reporters, Seth McLaughlin and Susan Friccio. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Good morning, George. Good morning. Susan, I'll start with you as the movement and the pieces are starting to come into place very quickly now here as we prepare for a second Trump administration. They are taking some of the lessons we learned from the first time around in which Trump used some of his business acumen to appoint people and he's sticking with some more political veterans, people from the Hill. At least Stefanik is going to serve as ambassador to the United Nations. Michael Waltz going to be his national security advisor. Um, it, it's, it's a little bit of keeping loyalist type of people, but maybe sticking with people who know Washington better than those he appointed in his first administration. That's exactly right, George. The key word is loyal. And if you look at the list of people he selected, they have been loyal to him really all along through thick and thin. And, it, you know, if Right now, there's a report that Christy Noem of the South Dakota governor may be appointed to um, Homeland Security to head that department. Well, she was one of the early, early backers of the resurrection of Trump's political career. And she said very early on that she wasn't going to run for president because she knew he would be the nominee back when it really wasn't clear whether he would be the nominee. So she was one of his early cheerleaders. She's also a governor of a state so she can get things done. She's also a member of Congress, which can sometimes make it easier to win confirmation and to get run that gauntlet with fewer headaches. Um, same with reports about Marco Rubio. We don't know. This is, has not been confirmed yet, but reports that he will head State Department is a pretty big deal. He would be a shoe in at confirmation. Again, he's already a member of the club that does the confirmations in the U.S. Senate. Got a lot of experience on uh, foreign relations and intel in the U.S. Senate. So again, a person who has stood by Trump through all his uh, criminal trials and all, all the scandals and all the ups and downs, Rubio, who once ran against Trump in the primary in 2016, became one of his staunchest allies in the Senate. Trump remembers that. And he wants to put people in place this time that aren't going to um, go soft on this very bold agenda that may not be easy to carry out. So he wants people who are really going to stick with that. Lee Zeldin, another loyal um, soldier in Trump world. Again, somebody, he almost won governor in New York. He, he was seven points away from becoming a Republican governor in New York. Uh, a very a popular member of the Republican conference in the U.S. House. Um, important part of the party. People saying, what's his future going to hold? This get, putting him at the uh, EPA, the place in the U.S. government that's had probably the most impactful regulations under the Biden administration in terms of our energy production, in terms of prices, uh, what you know, what consumers pay for. That's a very important job. And Trump wants someone who can go in there and really tear apart some of those regulations and roll them back and 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 uh, weed them out so that the economy can again get rolling with energy. This is this is the Republican agenda. So these are the people he's picked to help carry that out. Same with Mike Waltz, um, another uh, uh, very loyal member of the Trump uh, world. And he is someone who it will be absolutely essential in his role um, as a DNI. So all these picks are, are predictable in many ways. It's a question of who's going to get what. So a lot of people thought Rick Grinnell was going to be uh, heading State Department. We still don't know who the actual pick is. We just see the reports. I think Rick Grinnell, uh, former ambassador to Germany, and again, someone who was stuck by Trump's side and been a surrogate for him these past few years. I expect to see him in an important role, too. We just don't know what that is yet. A few things here, George. Uh, Marco Rubio, quite the evolution from tiny Marco to, or little Marco, to potentially leading um, the Defense Department is it, or Secretary of State's office. Um, and then on top of that, you know, during the campaign, Trump always talked about how when he first came to D.C. during his, his initial term, that he didn't really know people. And that over time, he, he got to know the good ones and the bad ones. I believe that's kind of his, the language he would use. So this go around, just as you said in the intro, and just as Susan said, you know, driving home there, is he knows way more people that are uh, involved, that have been 
laying down the groundwork for a second term. This is an entirely different beast, I think, compared to when he first took office because like Susie Wiles was his first um, uh, person that he kind of put forward that's going to be his chief of staff. And if you think about his first term, he went through four chiefs of staffs. Now, Susie just went through a, a really grueling campaign with him um, and, and opted seemingly very quickly to sign on as chief of staff, which is no easy job. You know, you're not sleeping that much. Um, you're kind of, you're on 24 uh, seven. And so this is a different scenario than the last go around where he started off with Rance Priebus, went to John Kelly, Mick Mulvaney and Mark Meadows. And I think you're kind of seeing that across the board um, with Tom Holman getting selected as the new board czar. He knows Tom, you kind of know which way the ship is going. Same with Elise Stefanik, someone who used to defend him, you know, tooth and nail during the committee hearings on some of the Russia stuff. Stephen Miller, he's been around now for, uh, I guess, since the 2016 campaign. He used to work for Jeff Sessions um, as his chief of staff or chief communications officer. Sessions endorsed Trump, and he's stayed in his orbit ever since. So this is, I mean, I, last time around, it's the old metaphor, you know, building the plane while you're flying it. This is not the case this time around. And he's got a lot of people to pick from. And, and he does this, Seth, with arguably the biggest mandate since Barack Obama's first term in, in 2008 when he won election. 312 electoral votes for Trump. He wins the popular vote. The first time a Republican's done that since George W. Bush's second term in 2004. Uh, and he does so by running up the margins in these seven battleground states that we talk so much about that he swept all of them. And Seth, as someone that's been out, you know, traveling the country and been in a lot of these different places, is that something that you would expect it? Because Harris performed at or better than Biden's levels. That wasn't necessarily the issue for Democrats, but Trump added so many more people from different backgrounds, Latino, uh, black, everybody across the spectrum, people that traditionally, quote unquote, may have voted for Democrats ended up in, uh, many of them ended up in Trump's column than did in Harris's column this time around, it seems. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that my inclination going into the election night was that Trump was favored, but you never know what these things, you know what I mean? Like, you wait, voters have their say, and then you can connect the dots after. And in retrospect, it seems like the Trump campaign did a fantastic job of reaching low propensity voters in some of these states that might not always turn out. And uh, some of that was actually shown in the fact they voted for Trump, but perhaps not some of the down ticket um, Republicans. I think, you know, just maybe going a little bit broader on this, George, is like people underestimate that Trump is such a singular force uh, in our political arena. This guy is 78 years old and he was barnstorming the country, active every day, doing interviews with with young folks, young podcasters to kind of reach that demographic, which seems to have helped him on college campuses all across the nation. And it, he has had a, such a nonstop motor that I think he was just once again able to dominate the conversation like no one has been able to dominate the conversation uh, before. Um, and just a kind of an anecdote along those lines. I was talking to someone who was on the campaign plane quite a bit and they would say that senators who would act as surrogates would get on the plane. They do like a 48 hour spin. Maybe it's a 24 hour spin, you know, hitting some of the battleground states with Trump and they'd be exhausted. And Trump at 78 years old would be full speed ahead. And so I guess I don't know if enough has been made of that. Um, and I think that helped him dominate the airwaves, dominate the messages, be in arenas that most politicians don't go. Again, the podcast, hitting younger generations, and it all paid off. And Susan, the coattail effect of that is the, the biggest star of the night uh, in terms of legislatively. The Senate returns to Republican hands with a 53 vote majority. There are 53 Republican senators sworn in here when we get to uh, January 3rd, taking seats that might have favored Democrats initially, but people like Dave McCormick, Dave McCormick in Pennsylvania, in Pennsylvania, Sheehy in Montana, uh, al allowed to ride Trump's coattails. Whereas McCormick two years ago against Mehmet Oz failed even in the primary election, and then Oz loses to John Fetterman. But 
Republicans able to flip those key Senate seats and not just barely taking a, a pretty sizable majority with them. When they get to Washington, they'll have a Senate that whoever is going to be the next Republican leader, which you've written about recently, it's going to be a Senate that is pretty much going to align in lockstep with the things that Trump wants to do. And potentially, as we've heard in, in recent days, bypassing the traditional appointment process for nominees in the Senate with those three people who are in line to potentially be Republican leader agreeing that, yes, there may be they may allow a change in the Senate rules to have appointments during recess. Maybe <laughs> all those things you just said, maybe <laughs> the Senate, 53, that's that's a number that's easier to work with than 51 because you can't have that like one person who decides they, they want all the leverage in the world. Um, and that's, you know, the, the Joe Manchin effect. Uh, you know, they may get those recess appointments. They may cut some deal with Democrats to move stuff faster because recess appointments are a real sticky issue in the Senate. And it's something that uh, Trump is asking for right now. And now that we're in the middle of this GOP leadership election, you see the top contender, John Thune of South Dakota, saying that that's something that he would consider. Um, and I think that that's all the things you said are really important. The House was also preserved by the GOP. They hung on to the majority there. That's so critical because now what you have is the, the sweep of government because I call it the green light. You know, they, they can hit the gas and see what they can churn out while they've got full control of government, even with the filibuster in the Senate. They, they plan to use a process that has been popular in past, um, you know, unilateral governments we have all controlled by Democrats or Republicans, and that's just called budget reconciliation. They're going to, that, that allows them to pass things in the Senate and you, without having to deal with the filibuster, but you have to fit it all in this one bit, one bill that conforms to certain rules. So for Republicans, it's going to be tax reform, extending the 2017 tax cuts, which are, some of them are going to expire in 2026. Some of them are already being phased out. Some of the business taxes, putting all those back into place, about $3 trillion dollars, of costs there. And then we heard Trump on the campaign trail make several big tax promises. What did he say? He said, no taxes on retiree social security checks, no taxes on tip, no taxes on overtime. That's money that's going to not come into the treasury. So it's going to be a little bit of a fight trying to get that stuff attached to this bill. But, you know, they want to, you know, I've talked to the Ways and Means Committee over in the House. They're writing their own bill saying that we want to carry out Trump's campaign promises. That's what he promised. Over in the Senate, back to your original uh, stuff at the top there. They don't move as quick as the House. They're, they're, wanting, they're going to be worried about the deficit. Where's this money coming from? Now we're going to get into this discussion about tariffs, another Trump promise. So this idea that now that we have all Republican government, it's going to be smooth sailing. I warn anybody, having covered this uh, several times in my 30 plus year history, it's never that easy. In fact, once they all have control, they fight more. And there's little mini factions, little things that break apart as they try to get this stuff done. So people feel that vibe, that mandate vibe. If that's going to help Trump get this going quickly and just get off to a running start, it doesn't mean that he's not going to be have difficulty getting all this stuff done. I mean, most policy experts will say, and again, they're the policy experts, they're not the political experts. Some of this stuff is going to be really hard, you know, hard to carry. You know, they've, they've, they've got a very ambitious agenda. They'll get some of it done. It might be hard to get all of it done, especially all these tax cuts because of just the sheer amount of money it'll take out of the Treasury when you eliminate all that stuff and what it may do to the deficit, which Republicans are also really worried about. They're very cognizant. They're talking about spending on the campaign trail, talking about the exploding deficit. Now they're going to have to worry about that with some of their own policies. Our, hey, George, our colleague Lindsay McPherson had a great story today about just how the margins looked when Trump took over in the 115th Congress, um, where he had more wiggle room, right? Uh, so no matter what the final uh, final margin is here in both chambers, like Susan says, the, the mandate lasts only so long, right? And you got to really, I think, go quick and early while Democrats are licking their wounds to try to shove some of this through. But it takes time cobbling together all this stuff. And when you only have a few, uh, when your margin and your leeway is really small, it gets tough. And, and, to, and to your point, Susan, you know, you've got like a two year runway, basically. The party that's in power is generally somewhere in congressional elections repudiated 
after the first two years of a term. Not always, but Democrats, you can be sure, are going to try and mobilize in 2026 to flip one of those chambers back. The House is interesting because Mike Johnson, the speaker who <clears throat> excuse me, goes into office with such a slim majority in the first place, here he is again with a slim majority, arguably in a stronger position because now he has the backing of Trump, but also Trump taking folks like Stefanik and Waltz out of the House lowers that threshold for what you need to get passed, makes it a little bit harder for Republicans, especially if a special election comes up midway through next year. So there's those different contingencies that you have to manage. But Johnson arguably is in the most powerful position he's been in since he became Speaker. That's a really excellent point. And I talked to the Speaker's office um, the other day about what their thoughts were on his becoming Speaker again in this Congress that will convene on January 3rd. Someone could challenge him and they could have a mess like we had two years ago with the Republican Party or, or, or a lot of excitement, depending on how you look at it. There's, you know, it doesn't sound like there's anyone who is mounting a challenge to him right now. It wouldn't make sense for Republicans to do that. So assuming he becomes speaker, this is a problem that Democrats had two years ago. Biden started uh, four, four years ago. Biden started picking off their slim majority to serve, and he got a lot of them to serve, I think, four to serve in his administration. And it gave him a little tiny uh, majority. Now, Democrats are better than, at walking in lockstep than Republicans. That's been proven out past several um, Congresses. So this is a problem. So they've already taken away a couple of uh, lawmakers. Now, they don't have room for many more. So if, if Trump needs cabinet members or people to run agencies, he's in, even pulling out of the Senate. You're going to have to have a, an appointment if DeSantis is the pick for Secretary of State. That's easy. Ron DeSantis is a Republican. He'll put someone in. Republicans are pretty much assured of a victory in, in Florida right now. In two years, that could change a little, but it looks positive for them to replace that seat with another Republican. But you always take a risk when you pull from a very narrow majority Congress to have these people serve in your ca cabinet. And that is certainly a factor. You know that's what Republicans are talking about over in the House right now. Like, okay, that's enough. <laughs> okay, no, no more. We don't, I mean, they're the majority that which they just secured last night with the Colorado win um, seat in Colorado, they they don't have much to work with here at all. I mean, if they're gonna have just 218 votes, somebody not remember, you can't remote vote anymore. <laughs> this this calls into question many votes if someone's out sick, if Democrats say, look, nobody, nobody call out, make sure everybody's here. And with all this maximum pressure on Republicans and all it takes is one. And, it, and in the Republican Party, you can always find one who's not going to go along with stuff. So that's a great point, George. And I think it's one of the things we're going to be writing about um, as we enter this new Congress. Likewise, uh, I keep I'm obsessing with this. Uh, the Senate filibuster. What's going to happen? Oh, you know? yeah. That, yeah, that's not going anywhere right now. And it's funny. You'll hear some of the more, it's more uh, sort of hardline conservatives in the Senate say, well, maybe, maybe. I, I don't think so. First of all, here's my prediction is that barring some big upset, which would, of course, would be incredibly exciting, barring some upset, you're probably going to see John Thune, um, maybe Corn, and probably John Thune as the next majority leader. Um, he's a disciple of McConnell and Mitch McConnell, outgoing majority leader, Mitch McConnell, who's there running the Republican Party for 20 years. The guy who's all about the guardrails. OK, he does not. He did not. He wanted to protect that filibuster like it was his little baby. He's like, nobody is touching my filibuster. He I don't. And he because he wants to preserve the Senate for what he thinks, you know, it, it for, he wants to preserve the institution the way he thinks it's supposed to operate in America as the cooling saucer. So my thought is Republicans, I would be surprised if there was a wholesale shift. They are the party of not tampering with the filibuster. I heard a senator from Missouri, uh, Eric Schmidt, yesterday saying, well, you know, uh, you know, we're, we're not really thinking about that, but we want to get stuff done. There will be pressure on them to get rid of the filibuster the same way there was pressure on Democrats. I don't think they'll take the bait. I think that filibuster is um, safe for now. And, and that's what I think it could, you know, there could be some wholesale change in something that, that, that shifts everyone's attitude on this. I just don't think it's going to happen. This, well, time. this is what it could be because during Trump's first term, you know, McConnell was doing that with the guardrails and all that. And then Trump would pressure him to get rid of the filibuster. So I'm just yes, wondering right. if, if, you know, things change and things that are used to be sacrosanct and no longer sacrosanct. Yeah. And Trump, 
all of a sudden he weighs in and the world changes. Um, yeah, and, I agree. And I, and I think that's why they're going to try to get as much as they can done through this. But remember, I think they have one or possibly two bites at this apple where they can move stuff without the filibuster. So they have this path. That will that that can if Trump gets his tax cuts and we shove all this other stuff in there that he can then say promises made promises kept don't forget his big campaign slogan right. if they get enough of that through um, the reconciliation and it's a weedy term but keep that term in your head because you're gonna hear a lot about it if they are able to get a lot done through reconciliation they have 51 votes in the Senate that may take the heat off, but you're absolutely right. I, I know from just standing in the halls of Congress and listening to it year after year, the pressure will mount yeah. on the party that's in power to get rid of the guardrails and bum rush stuff through. I feel like this conversation has been going on long enough now, especially with Democrats threatening to, to pack the Supreme Court, meaning add more justices, um, add two more voting members, two more states so that we'd have more Democratic members of the Senate and House. Um, and other big changes by getting rid of the filibuster, Republicans know what would be down the pike if they did this. I mean, it's loud and clear, and they also campaigned against it. Yeah. So I, I don't know. That's a great question, Seth. How will they respond if their own agenda gets stuck in the 60-vote threshold again? I mean, what, how are they going to do that's it? That's another really important thing I think we need to watch for. And oftentimes when politicians are faced with the challenge of short-term success versus long-term challenges, uh, short-term often override long-term. Um, oh. Hey, George, one more quick thing. You had said something about the midterms coming up and that there's like a two-year window. I think it's a shorter window. I think actually the runway, you know, especially for people running in competitive congressional districts. The, the campaign starts now, doesn't it, for 2026? You know, I there is like a, there is still a honeymoon period, but I think it's months. I, you know, I don't think it's, it's not years. And sure, structurally it's years, right? But I, you know, the pressure starts building on people in any of these swing districts. Um, and it just makes life harder to cast deciding votes that are going to be used against you. So I think, you know, more and more the, the honeymoon window shrinks. It's definitely there. And you're going to see Trump and his team, I think, move fast or try to move fast to take advantage of the momentum. But on the flip side, you're probably going to see Democrats try to stall everything they can just to, you know, take a little air out of that balloon. And perfect transition as we wrap up here, just kind of what you expect to see, things people should watch for in the coming weeks and months. Susan's point about budget reconciliation is, is perfect and you're, it's accurate that you've got to kind of generally fit it into a budget or a monetary framework. Easy to do with something like a tax cuts plan, a little bit trickier to do with immigration, but with Tom Homan, <clears throat> excuse me, as the borders are, you can potentially do some executive actions on immigration to get some headway there. Whereas if you actually want to move major legislation that'll fit within a budget reconciliation framework, it's gotta have some of that budgetary aspect to it. It can't be necessarily policy. It's gotta have some numbers attached to it. And you can do that with something like a tax cuts bill uh, that would probably be one of the main first priorities that we'll see, Susan, as Congress convenes here in January. That's their number one bill, but it may not happen really quickly. Other stuff may pass. So, you know, the Senate's talking about taking a much longer period of time, but that, that could change. Um, let's watch for this thing called uh, um, the Congressional Review Act. OK, that's something that happens when you have the trifecta and you have one party in full control. What they try to do is undo what the last president did on the regulatory side, on the unilateral side with with um, they have a certain period of time where they can overturn this stuff in the House and the Senate. And then, of course, Trump would sign it. Um, they're, they're planning a robust uh, CRA agenda, meaning you're going to see a lot of bills pass the House and the Senate and head to Trump's desk that are going to undo not only what Biden has done um, within the past six months, I think there's a certain time limit, but what Biden's going to do between now and his exit, he's going to start dumping all kinds of regulations and things in place, more student loan forgiveness, all kinds of stuff. And then, of course, Congress will just move quickly to undo it because they can under this special law, um, Re Congressional Review Act, which has been used by both parties to undo the previous administration. It only works if you have, well, with rare exceptions, it only works if you have control of the House, Senate, and the White House, although Biden lost a few under his own Democrats. But 
this, this is something I'm going to be watching for. The second really important thing I'm going to be watching for Homan and, and, and heading up at the immigration deportation situation. Now, you know, some of this can be done, as you say, President Biden can just do, uh, President Trump can just put in place the stuff that help keep people from ch- coming to the border, like remain in Mexico and other um, policies that stop people from wanting to come here, stop the caravan, stop the, you know, enthusiasm for coming into the United States. He's going to do that right off the bat. But, you know, they've been campaigning on these deportations. So I've been listening carefully to how they're talking about how they're going to do this. And they're talking about basically, let's get rid of the first layer of people we don't want here who are the criminals. So they're going to start doing that. That's going to be interesting to see how they try to carry that out, especially because you have states like blue states like Massachusetts and New York saying they're not going to cooperate with any of this stuff um, with the detainers and all that. They're good, but the federal government is going to try to do how are they going to do that? And then. How are they going to, what are they going to do about this issue of people who aren't criminals, but are here and have kids here? That's when you're going to get in a real sticky situation and Democrats are going to, they're going to, they're going to seize on that and make the Republicans look like, you know, heartless people separating families. That to me is going to turn into something really fascinating to watch. How is Trump going to carry out that major campaign promise? um, Beyond removing the criminals who still make up a lot of people. That's now, there's all people who are in here with, with criminal records, et cetera, a number like more than a million people. So it's a lot of people. So can they just do that and say, well, we, we, we've accomplished our goal, or are they really going to try to remove people who are here, have been here a long time, have established roots? You know, this is where you're going to get into the hard, hard work of governing and politicking. Um, so that's one of the things I'm really focused on. And third, RCC really going to get rid of the Department of Ed. How many times have we heard someone say we're getting rid of the Department of Education? How many times? Um, Hard to do. How do you do that? The, 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 you know, dismantling. We always, we can add stuff to government. We're really good at that. Removing, yeah. taking away spending, taking away departments. It's been virtually impossible. So that's the if, other thing. If you run for office now, Susan, you say you're getting rid of the, uh, the Department of Ed and term limits. Those are two of the easiest ones. Oh yeah, yeah. That's the, those those are perennial. Yes, these are yeah. what, this is my big campaign problems. It's very hard to, to carry that stuff out. E- easy to expand government, hard to contract government. Not <laughs> yeah. Impossible to contract government, federal government. And, and Seth, uh, things that uh, you're looking for and people should be uh, keeping tabs on as we get closer to elect, uh, inauguration day and the swearing. I, th- I what Susan just said there is probably going to be the most interesting story going ahead. Is once they get into past the initial push of that uh, deportation effort, just the politics of that is going to be intense and all over the place. You know, you think the ads pushing grandma off the cliff for social security, you're bad, um, or, you know, aimed at driving the conversation, get ready. Um, beyond that, I think, you know, Trump, he, I'm really interested to see what he's going to do. Day one executive orders. He, I, this time around, Again, compared to last time, they, they were kind of figuring out on the go. But now, you know, I'm going to say Project 2025, but, you know, Trump has distanced himself from that. But he could also pick and choose from it. You know, there, there are various um, uh, groups in D.C. now that have built up around the MAGA movement who have carved out policy positions over the last four years that he could just take, you know, and, and he could use through executive orders and whatnot. So I think there will be a lot more there. And then I think the other thing is I'm curious to see the tariff evolution of Trump. What, where does this go? Like, is this, um, is the reality of it that tariffs are more of a negotiation leverage point against foreign countries to try to get them to do things you want them to do on trade or whatever? Or does he really impose them and really test, you know, what economists pretty much far and wide say is a dumb idea? But does Trump, as Trump does, say, no, we're taking convention and chucking it out the window and we're going to go full speed ahead and I'm going to show you that you're all wrong. Seth McLaughlin, Susan Ferriccio, I appreciate it as always. Thanks for the discussion. Thank you. Thanks, George. And a reminder that you can find Seth and Susan's work and all of our transition coverage at WashingtonTimes.com slash elections or click the politics tab at WashingtonTimes.com on the web or on your app. For Seth and Susan, I'm George Gerbo. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.